fossil, your fossil fossil oddities. James? James All right, good afternoon. Um, I, I've been a paleontologist for many years, and I've seen lots of fossils, and I still get wowed and blown away by some of the things that I see in the fossil record. So today I want to share with you uh, some of the uh, more unusual fossils uh, that I've come across. Uh, some of these are my own personal specimens, some of these are taken from the literature. Um, I want to start off with uh, some preservational oddities. So fossils are preserved in different ways. Um, some common preservation styles include uh, um, things preserved as black flattened films, we call that carbonization, or having things replaced by fool's gold or pyrite, or having a shell dissolved away so we just have a, an impression of the outside or the inside of, uh, of where the shell used to be. Um, petrified wood, okay, geologists call that permineralization. These are some common fossil preservation styles, but that's not the show thing. We're interested in unusual and odd things. So let's take a look at um, some preservational oddities. Um, without a doubt, my favorite and most colorful um, uh, preservation style is opalization. Okay, so here is an ordinary fossil clam, kind of blah looking from the Cretaceous of South Australia. But when you polish off the shell, hey, look at that. Oh, you know, beautiful rainbow colors. This is precious grade opal, gem quality opal, jewelry grade opal. Um, and uh, fossil clams are, uh, that are opalized are very common in this locality. In fact, they have also found um, fairly decently complete plesiosaur skeletons from this locality preserved in precious opal. Now, these things go for about $100 a pop, and it's just a little stupid clam. Uh, can you imagine what an entire plesiosaur, a Loch Ness monster type of creature, a complete plesiosaur skeleton preserved in gem grade opal would go for? Um, they, uh, they have them on display in the South Australian Museum. There's about two or three skeletons at uh, Adelaide and a couple skeletons at Sydney. So, some beautiful opalized uh, fossils. And it's not just clams of Australia that are like this. Here's some beautiful uh, opalized fossil wood from uh, Nevada, uh, from the Miocene. I, I've seen a lot of petrified wood, and most of it is just gorgeous when you cut and polish it. But uh, come on, give me a break. That, that, that without a doubt, takes you know, a, a first prize. Um, also, something that's somewhat colorful, in addition to opal, is um, mother of pearl. Okay? Uh, mother of pearl is somewhat common in very young fossils, but the world's record for the oldest known mother of pearl, um, uh, this is called a nacre, it's a variety of, uh, it's, a, it's a form of aragonite, is uh, this thing here from the Pennsylvania of Oklahoma. Uh, this is a limestone. The reason it's black is because it's impregnated with uh, degraded tar or asphalt. And uh, the original mother of pearl, which would normally have uh, converted to calcite by this time, is still preserved. So uh, here's uh, some beautiful, this is actually the world's uh, record for uh, the oldest mother of pearl. That's kind of unusual. Radioactive stuff. How many of you are into radioactive minerals? Well, if you're not and you want to be, there's a sample of radioactive stuff downstairs. Although I would recommend you stay away from it. But, you know, whatever you want, it's a free universe. Uh, did you know that some fossils are preserved in radioactive material? Um, so... You know, if you like to collect fossils, like a lot of us do, okay, in general, I'd recommend you just have a Geiger counter handy because you just don't want to just collect things and, you know, have them, you know, sleep with them under your pillow or whatever all the time just because there's a cool fossil. Because sometimes they give you a dose. Here are a couple of radioactive fossils uh, from out west. This is uh, some fossilized wood preserved in black uraninite, uranium dioxide. Um, this is a, um, a stegosaur tail spike that is impregnated with a little bit of carnitite. Um, this is actually out in the field. Okay, this is actually part of a, a public park near Denver. So you can actually go see that and stand there and get a, get a dose. Um, so if you stick a scintillometer next to this thing, uh, we got 422 counts per minute from that wow. specimen right there. Wow, okay, but right there it is, right, right on the outcrop. Um, soft bar preservation is one of my research areas as a paleontologist. Um, I usually work on invertebrates, but vertebrates are also known to have soft part preservation. Uh, one of the best preservation styles on the planet is original uh, skin, original muscles, original uh, guts. Um, some of you may have heard that sometimes they find Ice Age uh, animals uh, uh, melting out of the ice in Siberia and Alaska. Well, it's true. And you may have heard that sometimes people have eaten the meat from these sorts of things. Well, it's true. <laughs> Um, I, I'm not in the habit of doing that. Probably tastes like chicken. But uh, here's here's a very famous example. Um, Siberia has uh, is famous for having quite a few uh, skeletons and carcasses of woolly mammoths. Uh, one of the more famous ones is this uh, baby uh, woolly mammoth uh, from the late Pleistocene of Siberia, and. Uh, 
When it was alive, it was covered with a coarse hair, because it was the Ice Age. So I know this looks like Snuffleupagus, but that's a fairly decent uh, reconstruction of this thing in a museum in, in Russia. So this thing has mostly lost its hair. It's a little bit of hair around the toes. And uh, you, know, you can buy mammoth hair in the retail market. Turns out almost all of that has been stolen from Russian museums, but oh well, what can you do? Uh, so here's uh, some beautiful soft part preservation from the Pleistocene of uh, Siberia. I mean, it doesn't get weirder than this or more beautiful than that. And speaking of soft part preservation, if we go older in time, back in the Mesozoic, sometimes we get dinosaurs with skin preserved. Uh, some dinosaurs had feathers or hair-like feathers, and some just had uh, scaly skin. Here's a beautiful uh, hadrosaur uh, skin preserved. It's not the original parts, but it's still a very unusual sort of fossil. Um, something a little bit different. These things are, well, they used to be fairly common in the Coosa River Valley of Alabama. Uh, they're from the Middle Cambrian, and uh, they are uh, siliceous concretions. And when these were first described, uh, people said, well, not sure what these are, uh, but they're some sort of creature. And then when people looked at them later on, they said, oh, come on, those are just trace fossils, they're just burrows. So obviously, it just a worm went down the sediment and, and made, a, made a burrow here, and then made a burrow there, made a burrow there, made a burrow there, you know, looking for food. So for the longest time, paleontologists have said, oh, these famous star cobbles are simply trace fossils. Now, I mean, I like trace fossils, don't get me wrong, but burrows are kind of, you know, blah compared to some fossils. But what's cool is, turns out these aren't trace fossils. Okay, just in 2005, uh, a, uh, a restudy of these has indicated that, okay, these are fossil sponges. So all of a sudden, from blah, but kind of interesting shape, trace fossils, to really cool, oh my gosh, look at these, these are fossil sponges. Um, very few fossil sponges have had this preservation style, so I would say this is fairly unique. And some of you may have heard of the famous Maison Creek deposit near Chicago. Um, one of the more uh, common fossils in these concretions are preserved jellyfish. You can see a couple of tentacles sticking down there. Now think about it, a jellyfish, you know, it's like, what, 90, 95% water? You know, I, I, I would think it's easier to preserve snot than it is to preserve a jellyfish. <laughs> and yet here you have it. I mean, what, what in the world is going on here? So here are a couple of beautiful preserved uh, jellyfish. Um, there are some people who specialize in collecting these things, and a lot of them don't show the tentacles. I would think it's easier to preserve snot than to preserve jellyfish. <laughs> and yet, here you have it. I mean, what is going on here? So I hear a couple of beautiful preserved uh, jellyfish. Um, there are some people who specialize in collecting these things, and a lot of them don't show the tentacles. They're just, you know, kind of shapeless blobs. So uh, the, the, the collectors in the field, they would just say, oh, this is blob A, and oh, this one looks a little bit different, let's call that blob B, and oh, this one looks a little bit different, let's call this one blob with character. So here's one of the blobs from Chicago. <laughs> now, I don't know if you know anything about fossil algae. Uh, my first ever fossil project as a researcher was on some fossil red algae from the Ordovician of Quebec City in Canada. Um, and it was a, a fossil red algae called Solenopera. What's really cool is if you look in the Jurassic of Britain, they have Solenopera as well, and the original red stuff is still there. So here is a beautiful fossil red algae with the original uh, uh, reddish pinkish pigmentation. Uh, the Brits call this uh, beetroot stone. That's fascinating stuff, preserved in a nice fossiliferous limestone. Amber, you know, oh my gosh, you know. It, the, the, the stuff that gets preserved in amber just, just blows your mind. It's just unbelievably beautiful stuff. I mean, look at that. How can you not like that beautiful lace bug? Um, you know, here's a bunch of uh, roundworms that are escaping from the body of a crane fly. So this thing got developed in, uh, it, it got enveloped in uh, some, some sap from a tree, and all these uh, little roundworms try to escape, uh, but they obviously didn't. So that's just a beautiful example of parasites were originally in the body of this thing trying to escape. And of course, you know, what are the odds of having something like that preserved? Just unbelievable <laughs> preservation. You now, call me silly, but I would call that unusual. And if you know your amber, I challenge you to look at these and think, holy cow, how do you get that? In fact, uh, the French amber book from which I took these pictures uh, labeled both of these impossible amber. This is a cnidarian, which only uh, grows and lives in the ocean. Amber is fossilized tree sap. Okay, trees only grow hmm, on the land. So how do you get an ocean creature in amber? So, I mean, it just, it just boggles the mind. But here you have a marine cnidarian preserved in Polish amber. Unbelievable. And what's even cooler is if you take a look at this thing. This is the tail from a gecko. Okay, some of you may know that some lizards, uh, and, uh, if a predator uh, grabs them by the tail, they can let go of their tail and survive. 
Okay, you can even see a little bit of blood uh, still there. Uh, this thing got partially caught in, in, in sap, and uh, it just let go of its tail. So it's a, <laughs> unbelievable. Here is a, a beautiful fossil uh, leaf beetle, and uh, it is trying to uh, defend itself from the sap, obviously unsuccessfully, so it's releasing some, uh, a stream of chemicals. Beautiful preservation, very unusual.